Welcome to Polycast, a civilization podcast focused on game strategy. Canis Albinas. Makalua. The main team. Mega Bears fan. Welcome to episode 387 of Polycast. I'm Makalua. With me as usual, Canis Albinus. Live from a farm in Iowa with no internet. Ooh, special tricks. Mega Bears fan. Fully refreshed from a relaxing stay at a beach a couple weeks ago. Ooh, nice. And Phil is not with us today because, uh, or, sorry, me and Tim is not with us today because he's got some other stuff going on, so. It's nice to see family again after pandemic-induced difference or distance. Yeah, luckily we didn't have to quarantine super strict with uh, my close family, except for when they all had COVID. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, COVID really is not fun. Uh, the There was a lot of smoke in the air because of the wildfires this week, even in the eastern part of the U.S., and I can't breathe as well as I used to, and I am now feeling it, so... Oh, that's just a part of Las Vegas summers now, is the smoke and red haze from uh, California being constantly on fire. Yeah, that's not really new, it's just... No, but it, it, it is like every summer now, whereas, you know, it used to be like every few summers. It's a little bit dry this year. Well, we've uh, at least gotten a little more rain than we got last year. Last year uh, in Vegas, we did not see a single drop of rain throughout the entire pandemic. Like our last drop of rain was before the pandemic lockdown started, and we did not see a single drop for the rest of the calendar year pretty rough oh it was very rough whereas i've been sitting here with a relatively well not wet but not as dry as usual summer so my lawn is actually still green in july and up until this this coming week uh the weather's kind of forgotten that it's summer in texas it's just oh it's a little warm what are we supposed to have for highest next week oh maybe a hundred great that's not really unusual for that part of the world though yeah, I know, but I got. But we, we've all gotten used to the the milder version of Texas summer, and it's like, wait, what? He no. It's ninety six here today. It's probably gonna, it's probably going to get about that hot today here too. So, it's for reference, I'm in Des Moines, so we're right where the population is. All right, time for Civ. Yep. So we're going to start out with some excellent feedback that we got from the uh, last uh, episode, in particular the discussions that we had about uh, machine learning algorithms. And it is unfortunate that uh, me and team is not with us today to uh, talk about these because he was the most ardent advocate for uh, um, implementing machine learning algorithms in uh, Civ, and uh, all of this stuff is more critical of the idea. But uh, the first one that we will go over is on the um, Civ Fanatics uh, forum thread about uh, the last episode, which at this point now was like a whole month ago. Like, my gosh, you missed one episode, and it seems like it's forever until the next one. Uh, Anyway. uh, Well. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, uh, Degiel, Degiel, I'm not sure how this is supposed to be pronounced. Uh, posted on the Syphonatics forum topic, uh, guys, you are missing one crucial point in your AI discussion uh, in comparison to StarCraft. As far as I know, the StarCraft AI is learning to play on one very specific map. Only one map. It learns when to expand, where to expand, which 
uh, routes to take when attacking, where to defend. Furthermore, the terrain is actually very simple in StarCraft as uh, compared to Civ. Uh, it's got high ground, low ground, and walls. In a 4X game such as Civ, the terrain is usually procedurally generated and different for each game, and the created terrain itself is highly variable with a large impact on of terrain type on unit behavior. This is a huge difference in demands for self-learning AI. And uh, Degiel is completely correct. That was something that none of us uh, thought to, to bring up in that discussion, uh, what, now four weeks ago. Uh, it's which- a shame I wasn't here for that discussion because I would have brought that up. But uh, the problem with saying that that's an issue with machine learning is Moore's Law, and eventually we'll be able to handle that. Right now, we probably can't, but um, it will not be long before computers are capable of handling that more easily. Well, and that's also uh, assuming a machine learning AI uh, that is good enough to play on par or beat experts. It's entirely possible that you could have a machine learning AI that could learn more generalized rules that makes it competent at the game, but not necessarily uh, even with the procedural generation that is, uh, without necessarily being at like expert level human play. A machine learning algorithm has to play it enough times to learn how to do it. Um, It would probably take more than a year of playing it to get it to that point that it is with StarCraft, and that would assume that it's a fairly fast process. Yeah, and I think that was, uh, I think, my my biggest uh, criticism in the previous episode was just saying that I don't know if if the Firaxis team and 2K have the time to wait for the machine learning algorithms to do that work, because you have to have a fairly finalized rule set for the game uh, before you can even do meaningful training in that sense. And if that takes until, you know, like within six months of the game's release, well, then you don't have a year to do uh, machine learning training, which means you would have to have developed another, you know, more standard, more traditional AI system in the meantime, which means do you now have the development resources to do both? You know, so it's it's a matter of resources and time and all that stuff, and uh, it would not be super easy. But again, unfortunately, we don't have Phil here to provide a uh, uh, counterpoint. One thing that I know works better in terms of machine hours is what Stardock did with Galsiv 2, which is look at what all the best players are doing and implement that. Yeah. And uh, Galsiv 2 is considered to have one of the best AIs in strategy games. So we know that that works, uh, especially with a game like Civ, where the final rule set wasn't really established until the last patch in August or in April. So how do we reconcile that with, oh, you need a year to play this so that you can learn how to use it? Um, the only way it would work functionally is if you built a machine learning AI system to learn how to play your game and then didn't touch it for a year. Right. And uh, kind of on a related note, there's a, a comment on the uh, YouTube uh, version of uh, the previous episode from Carl Blankshane that says, uh, you know, something similar to what I was just saying, which is that the limitations come down to cost. Uh, Civ is releasing a new game every four years or so. I think it's been a little bit more than that. Uh, but, you know, whatever. Uh, but the, the point of that, uh, for me, is, like, how old is StarCraft? Like, how long did the, you know, the Alpha Star developers have to get that working and get it playing well? Uh, with a game that was, as far as I know, like, you know, like complete not seeing large scale changes like you look at something like Civ where we have a new expansion pack coming out like I think pretty much every year and then you know this past year the new frontier stuff where you got new civs and rule changes uh coming in like every month or two months like that's a lot of retraining of the AI and I just I don't know that that's really feasible it's tough to design AIs. It's no matter how you do it. And machine learning kind of requires 
a little bit more awareness on, on the programming level. So it requires more talented engineers to do it. Whereas you don't have to pay as much for a procedural AI. So, yeah. And that's a, th- a thing too, which I don't remember if we brought up the last time, uh, which was that you, you have to develop the machine learning algorithm too. And that's not like something that you just pull off the internet and plug and play. Like, you know, machine learning is like, complicated like probably graduate you know computer science level stuff right your your uh interns <laughs> that you hire from the local university are not going to be writing your machine learning algorithm uh so like you have to have developers who are able to do that and that's pretty at this point still cutting edge stuff and i imagine that the supply of uh, software engineers who know how to implement machine learning is probably still pretty small and they're probably very expensive to uh, get onto your team i don't know if like the foundational work is that hard uh excuse me conceptually but i do know that making it effective is pretty expensive right well which is it's what i mean i mean yeah obviously you can just drop in a really simple system but the the point is we want the AI to be good. And if you don't put in a really good machine learning algorithm, the AI is still not going to be good. Uh, it's still going to be pretty stupid. It might get better over time if you have, like, you know, the user games reporting uh, game details back to, like, a server and stuff like that and using that to further improve the AI once it's released, which I assume they would do if they did implement machine learning. Uh, but, like, still, it would... Uh, it, it's really complicated, you know, high level stuff. Like I sure as hell would not am not going to be writing any machine learning algorithms anytime soon. I won't either and I actually have training in computer science. Yeah, I, I actually work as a uh, software engineer. So, uh and I, I have no idea how to do any of this stuff. I took one AI programming class in college, like my junior or senior year, and uh you know, it was all pretty high level stuff we didn't implement anything super complicated uh so i'm like yeah they're way over my head for sure i i implemented a mini max algorithm that's my ex that's my extent to ai programming right which is uh, just tic-tac-toe basically yeah and then uh and tic-tac-toe of course is an easily solved uh game which you know yeah you, you could just do with a bunch of if-thens <laughs> So it's not it's not a good idea to do it that way, but you can. No, yeah, definitely not. Uh, yeah, the the closest I ever got to developing uh, anything even remotely resembling a game in uh, in my classes at uh, university was uh, a computer graphics course where we made a, a version of uh, uh, what's it called, Brick Breaker. You know, where you you bounce the ball with the paddle to smash bricks. And uh, oh, yeah. and I did not control for uh, frame rate. So what happened was, as the bricks got broken, and there were fewer computations for uh, my code to do to determine collisions, the game sped up uh, to yeah. the <laughs> to the point where it became uh, unplayable. Like the ball was moving at friggin' light speed. And uh, in order to compensate for that, to make the game at least playable to the end, I had to make the paddle like eighty percent the width of the. Uh, screen <laughs> so uh, uh just from sheer probability the ball was almost certainly likely to hit the paddle and unless it went to the you know 10 percent of the screen that was off to the edges that was the only way you could lose yeah i've but, heard of similar things <laughs> but hey you know good enough for bachelor degree work am i right <laughs> that's all you need to do it yeah. shows you know how to do it right exactly. yeah Prove you know the concept. And then uh, uh, another comment that we got uh, on, you know, still similar topics. And again, I wish we had Phil here to uh, to directly uh, address this. Uh, but this is also on the YouTube video from uh, Et Sherry saying the, mach- the machine in StarCraft was not significantly better than the best StarCraft 2 players. That's a myth. They actually never come close to getting the Alpha Star to a pro level and then stop developing it for some unknown reason. Uh, again, I, I wish we had Phil here because uh, I think he knows more about this than than I do, certainly. So I don't know what the state of the machine learning algorithm in StarCraft II was or if it ended development or if it was competing with pro players. Uh, Phil seemed to think it was, but I don't know. Um, 
it's hard to be sure. There's been a lot of different tests over time, and I don't follow that scene. Yeah, StarCraft was uh, was never my bag. Well, it requires a higher clicks per minute than I can make. Yeah, that was always my frustration with it, too. Uh, I was fine on, like, the single-player campaign where I could pause the game for, like, a minute to look at stuff and figure out what the heck to do next. But uh, I, I never cared for having to play entirely in real time, and uh, the few times I tried playing against other people was just miserable. <laughs> yeah, when it was first, when StarCraft 2 was first out, I and Phil, and actually Willow, played some, like, as a team is three people against another team of three people and stuff, and they were so much faster than me. <laughs> it, was just, it was a little frustrating. It's like, I was almost fast enough to play well at it, but not really quite, and I don't know if that's just a my ref- reflexes in general or an age thing. It's, it's kind of hard for people in their 30s to go up against people in their teens. Even if you don't have sensory issues, like I have, but uh, Shoot, I had a I had a thought and it has disappeared. Go on without me. Yeah, <laughs> and then uh, on the the Civ Fanatics forum, we also have a couple other users, uh, Aristos and uh, Getamon, who are talking about the AI algorithms that were implemented in uh, Civ Six and some of the other games. Uh, Ar- Aristos says. Uh, that the AI paradigm of behavior trees that was used for Civ Six is already obsolete. Again, I don't know all that much about uh, video game AI, so I don't know if that's true or not. Um, it pretty much is, unless you're using something that is specifically designed for it. Yeah, and uh, Aristos recommends that instead, Fraxis should maybe be using something called Utility AI, which uh, this user posits is a best system for turn-based strategy games. And ironically, again, Civ Five scratched the surface and implemented Bare Bones Utility AI framework. Uh, and it was easier, easy to see how superior vanilla Civ Five AI is to Civ Six. Uh, BT? What is BT? Oh, uh, Behavior Trees. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. It's been a long time since i played Civ V. I don't know if I would say that Civ V's vanilla AI was better than Civ VI's current AI, but it's entirely possible. I would argue that it kind of is, because the Civ V AI actually actively tried to kill you. And I don't remember. I don't. I don't. I, I have never been in danger of being destroyed by a Civ Six AI, but yeah. I have routinely been killed by Civ Five AIs. I was gonna say, I've, I've always playing Civ Five. I always felt like they were actually a legitimate threat. Whereas in Civ Six, is more like I just have to manage some things and I'll be fine. Yeah, for in my experience with Civ Six, I, I've it's always hard for me to tell whether or not it's the AI playing poorly or just the a combination of the AI just lacking uh, enough units, because as I've said before, the AI seems to have this tendency where they build all their units early in the game and then don't build any units later in the game. So if you kill all their units early, they don't have any for the rest of the game. And then there's the issues we've, you know, the the horse we've beaten to death over and over and over again so much, which is uh, the defensibility of cities with walls. So I, I was never, it's never been clear to me with Civ Six if it's a case of the AI being bad or just other design issues in the game that uh, just make it hard for the AI to compete. If the AI is not building units after the classical era, that is a problem with the AI. That is not a problem with the game. Well, true, but what I, what I meant was the, the tactical AI specifically, the, the military AI, as opposed to more the, the empire building management, city management AI, which are which I think typically are like different systems that have some interaction with each other, but they're, it's not like one... You know, as I understand it, it's not one big AI that does everything, and they're yeah. broken up into like sub AI modules that handle you know all the city planning stuff, and then another AI that handles all the uh, the military action. So if the you know it, it could be that the tactical AI is doing the best it can with the limited resources that the Empire AI is giving it, uh, but it, it's kind of hard to tell because that Empire AI is so severely hamstringing the. Uh, military tactical AI. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, I remember reading at one point that the, you have the strategic AI for the long term and then the tactical AI for the short term. And then 
somehow the strategic AI for the city building stuff is supposed to take the signals it gets from the tactical AI and build units as accordingly, but it sounds like the strategic AI is not following through. Yeah, that definitely is what it seems like to me. I don't know if if all of you have the same experiences that I have with the AIs just not having units later in the game, but it has been a consistent problem for me on the difficulty levels that I've been playing at. It's been the same for me. And this is going back, I think, probably to at least the first expansion. Like, it's not even a, it's not a new phenomenon for me either. Speaking of existing <laughs> problems, <laughs> or are we done? Oh, I was just going to add really quickly that, uh, yeah, because it's very easy to sit there in a city, like, let them attack you first and drain all of their units off, and then you can go into their territory. And that would not work anywhere near as well on a human player. But they just like no, human, right human, human, players would eat you, human players would eat you alive if you tried that. Yeah. Yeah, it did work also fairly well in against the Civ V AI. It's just that it was a lot harder to pull off because the Civ V AI, when it would come after you, it would come after you typically with overwhelming uh, numbers. Lots of units, yes. Yeah, and that's, again, just something that Civ VI's AI just does not do. They'll, they'll send their, their two melee units, their two ranged units, and maybe a siege unit that gets killed before it even gets a shot off, and that's it. And then you kill their two melee units, and then their two ranged units just stand there bombarding the city down to zero HP, but can't capture it because they're not melee. What was it? On on Deity, you could expect six warriors and two archers on turn 19 if they were going to attack you? In Civ 5? Yeah. It's really hard to deal with. And then we have somebody at the bottom who says, why is Polycast not available through Apple Podcasts? Um, mostly because we are not exactly interested in getting a huge audience that will put a lot of burden on the, on the Civ Fanatics servers. Um, and we're kind of a niche product and we don't really need a bunch of other people that don't know what Civ is looking at us. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, is there also like a registration fee for putting stuff on Apple podcasts? There might be. We used to be on iTunes many, many years ago, and then something happened, and I don't know the full story behind that, but um, we yeah. have thought about going on to the podcast directories, but in order to do that, we'd have to lose the fact that we have 380-some episodes in Backlog. You, we wouldn't be able to serve them all up through the website because the bandwidth would be ridiculous. And we get our bandwidth from the generosity of Civ Fanatics, so that would be bad custodianship on our part. Yeah, I was uh, not sure if I should ask you that question. I didn't want to put you on the, the spot, but uh, thank you for addressing that question from the Space Cowboy. Well, you can put me on the spot with any question you want. If it's not something I'll answer, I'll just say I won't answer. All right. I'll remember that for the future. Yeah. I just wasn't sure if that was more a Canis question or a Dan question. Well, it mostly comes down to we could, we definitely could, uh, but what's the benefit? And it has consequences. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, if if you've noticed, I'm already pretty bad at getting these episodes published to Civ Fanatics on like a timely fashion on a lot of weeks. Like it won't show up till Wednesday or Thursday or sometimes the weekend after it goes live. Whereas it's supposed to be, you know, on Sunday, the day after we record. But, you know, real life happens and, you know, I've got family and other obligations and sometimes I just don't get around to it. So having a larger yeah. audience, especially a more, you know, general interest audience Local. yeah that's expecting yes, that's what would be <laughs> that's we were on there yeah that, that's also an issue if if we were doing this like more professionally or semi-professionally and you know we had like a you know patreon or something with contributors or a kickstarter or something backing us and funding us uh that would be a totally different story but as it stands now this is a totally amateur uh production totally amateur totally hobbyist um, yeah, we are all doing I, this on outside of our own, you know, nine to five jobs. So, 
and I'm still trying to recover from all the mental issues that I have had over the last several years. So once those are over with, maybe I'm not going to say no, but yes. for now, no. There are always possibilities. Maybe they'll actually create a um, system where we don't have to keep 380 some episodes in backlog and risk having for uh, uh, Civ fanatics have like terabytes of data that they have to send through us because that would be bad. You don't want to do that to them. They're very nice to us. Yes, we don't want them to get the podcast version of the hug of death. Yeah. Anyway, before we start reiterating again, um, we have a list of, let's see if I can find it. Working from my phone to do this podcast is not easy because if I try to open any website, it gets all glitchy. But uh, this is from Hi Tato, and it is a collated list of remaining issues in Civ 6. And we're not going to read this whole thing because it's a very long list. But uh, we can go through some of the highlights. Uh, several of these things relate to, several of the things at the top of the list relate to the fact that vampires and zombies and uh, the barbarian clans and the apocalypse and dramatic ages and all the game modes don't all work together very well. Some of the things don't, um, you know, they aren't properly implemented to interact with each other. For instance, the Dramatic Ages lists that zombies don't attack free cities, which means you can't use Dramatic Ages and zombie defense at the same time without the game becoming ridiculous. Um, and then you've got another big issue where the AI will not improve resources until economics if monopolies and corporations is turned on. Oh my gosh, is, is, is that what's what? happening? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it all makes sense really now. Problem. That's uh wow. I, I don't know not... if that's specific to the game mode, but that is a thing that I know does happen sometimes. Um, some of the ba- the heroes are not all balanced properly. Oh, the barbarians. Yes. Go ahead. I was going to say with the heroes, yeah, some of them are absolutely still broken. I mean, it's in a fun way, but when the AI gets a hold of the broken ones, it's like, oh boy. Well, and then Hippolyta and Mulan are very uh, sign- are significantly weaker, and Sun Wukong is a scout, basically, and Anansi is badly scaled, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And Secret Societies has some issues. It would be really nice if Her- Hermetic Order showed you where the ley lines were before you picked it. <laughs> And it would also be nice if the second and third promotions were reversed, so uh, you weren't getting the the uh, ad, the university buff before universities are available, and the second buff in that situation would be pushing up the yields of the ley lines. Vampire castles do not dynamically update their yields, which means you need to move your vampires all the way back and then remove and replace the castle. And since vampires are so slow, this is a problem. Uh Uh-oh. Lost my list. Vampires have inconsistent rules for inheriting unit strength. Uh, They don't inherit giant death robots, which, I mean, that might be a design decision. (laughs) At that point in the game, come on. At that point, who cares? Yeah. Um... And similarly with uh, Owls of Minerva, uh, you get uh, the second promotion well before you get Banks. And uh, that means that you can't build the Gilded Vaults. Stupid thing. Stay open. The fourth promotion for Owls of Minerva is very weak. And then Civilization Balance Issues. and a Crouching lot of this tiger. is uh, is more like opinion and editorialized. These aren't so much bugs as it is the posters' ideas for improving some of the weaker civilizations and units and buildings and stuff. Yeah. Uh, I will agree that the Crouching Tiger is still a bad unit and should probably be a crouching uh, trebuchet replacement now. Oh yeah, definitely. 
Um, I also noticed uh, on the, the topic of the, the new units that were added, uh, while I was playing last night, I noticed that the uh, Eureka for, gosh, what was it? The technology that unlocks infantry is still to build three muskets and not to build line infantry, which I thought was kind of weird, considering that uh, now line infantry precedes infantry. And uh, what had happened yeah. was I had like one or two muskets before unlocking the tech for line infantry and then upgraded them to line infantry and built additional line infantry. So I never got the Eureka for plastics because I never had three musketmen because I got line infantry too early. So that should probably be changed. Yeah. And then I have to read through all these to make sure um, that I'm not just reading opinions. Yeah, Kree's uh, domestic trade route bonus does get very quickly outshone by international ones. Uh, I do like the idea for Gaul about uh, making the harbor exempt from the rule where they're not allowed to place districts adjacent to the city center. And I would like to append that by saying that could maybe apply to, or that rule should maybe only apply to land districts anyway. So maybe the uh, water park should also be exempt. There's also not too many <clears throat> situations placing harbors where placing it by the city center isn't the best location you're going to have. Yeah, the city center is like a plus two bonus by itself. And then, like, coastal resources are, I th- are they plus a half or are they plus one each? I think they're plus one each. And uh, just getting two of them in a position where you can tuck the, uh, the harbor in between two water resources uh, is still not even better than just putting it next to the city center with no water resources. So, yeah. If you have water resources, they're plus one each. Right. Yeah, if you, if but you because get a of... nice... <clears throat> oh, go ahead, Mackie. Yeah, sorry. If you get a nice cluster of them together, like you've got, especially if you get multiple different types or something, and you can get a plus three or a plus four from that, okay, then sure, put it over there. But I don't know, three quarters of the time, it's usually right by the city center is the best spot. Yeah, and part of that is because of the fact that the uh, water resources only show up on the coastal water tiles, which are often just a one tile wide, you know, ribbon around the land anyway. So in a lot of cases, even if you have two of them and you can tuck the, the harbor in between them, like there's just not another coastal water tile, you know, on the other side of the land for there even to be a third one for you to be adjacent to. So, yeah, it's it's a difficult thing to get high adjacency bonuses with the harbor. Let's see. Georgia is still suck, apparently. Yeah. France, the chateau unlocks too late for how restrictive it is. Maya needs additional housing from the palace to avoid being crippled early, and their start bias is still putting them in the oceans, deserts, and tundra. Poland has a design that relies on encampments, holy sites, and commercial districts, but then has its unle- its unique unit unlocked through culture. Wars of liberation and golf courses for Scotland are not properly balanced. Yeah, Wars of Liberation, uh, I always found, were exceedingly difficult to get the requirements for. Yeah. I think the reason for that was because they had to be, like, a suzerain before the war even started. So, even if you become their suzerain during the war, and then they're captured, I think you're still not allowed to uh, uh, declare a War of Liberation. Or something like that. I don't remember. It was complicated. For districts and buildings, the preserve is still much too expensive for what it does, apparently. I don't know about that because I've never used a preserve. I, I've preserve used them a couple also- times. And yeah, I agree that they're kind of expensive for the limited things that they do. And the, the second point is the bigger issue for me, which is that the place that I would put a preserve is always the place where later in the game I want a national park to be. So the fact that the national park can't be, or the preserve can't be in the national park, and you can't tear down the preserve to replace it with a national park, uh, kind of makes the preserve a no-go for a lot of games for me. I mean, I feel like, go ahead. And it's also taking up a district slot you might want to use for something else. Yeah, that's true, too. I would use the uh, preserves a lot more if they were, like, considered an engineering district or whatever, like the aqueduct and uh, canals and dams and stuff, where it doesn't count towards your uh, 
your district population cap. Which makes sense, because, like, the idea of having a nature preserve, and we might have brought this up, like, when this was first announced, but the point of a nature preserve is to not have people living there. So, you, you shouldn't need higher population to put one down, just from a thematic standpoint. The sewer is too weak for how much it costs. The stock exchange is too weak for how much it costs. And it's, then it says neighborhoods are too are still too weak. What does that mean? Uh, given the lack of uh, delineation, we're going to ignore that. Yeah, it could either mean that the poster thinks that housing later in the game is not important enough to warrant building neighborhoods, or they think that uh, neighborhoods aren't providing enough housing, or that neighborhoods, by removing the underlying yield, uh, are reducing the productivity of the city, and that the extra housing doesn't offset that. Could be any of those. I think there are some new policies, though, that uh, do add yields to... uh, neighborhoods so you know maybe with those they are much better i don't think i've used them yet well there's public transport which gives money for neighborhoods with breathtaking appeal i i feel like i remember there being something else that gave production and food to neighborhood districts but i don't remember for sure if there was or what it was Let's see. The free market is a badly designed card, as plus four commercial hubs are extremely uncommon unless you are the Owls of Minerva. Plus, there are much better cards for making gold. That may be true, except that's not really the point of the card, is it? I forget. Which one was free market? What did that do? Free market is the one that does, if you have plus four in the district, it does a certain thing. Which I think is like the it's the the gold version of rationalism. I cannot look it up, otherwise I would. Grand Opera is also a weak card, which I think is the same issue they have, because theater building district buildings do not produce much culture. Public transports cannot really be run in a competitive economic slot, even if you have comp- multiple neighborhoods with breathtaking appeal. Congo, the one who might actually spam unique neighborhoods, will have low appeal from rainforests and will not benefit from it. And then, uh, according to this, the unit balance says the entire recon line of units is pretty much useless if you're using barbarian clans or zombie defense mode. They don't even do their job well after the ancient era in in the base game. I have uh, advocated, I think, even since Civ Five, that um, recon units should have a combat, an inherent combat bonus against barbarians, even if it's just like a plus fifty or plus a hundred percent only when defending. Uh, that would make them a lot more survivable while doing their jobs of, you know, exploring and reconning out by themselves. Uh, I think that would make them a lot more useful, or at the very least, the survey policy should like include like a plus one hundred percent combat strength for recon units versus barbarians, and maybe also free city units. Late game oil keep up or oil upkeep melee units are much slow, much weaker and slower than the equivalent heavy cavalry. I think that was a major topic that we discussed one or two episodes ago. Yeah. Basically, they don't like the oil system, which I can understand, but also get over it. Light light cavalry is better off unupgraded as helicopters are weak and use up aluminum, which is better used for planes. The AI does not understand resource upkeep at all and will readily go into a deficit and eventually hit zero. Aircraft carriers need more melee strength and anti-air value and a new way to gain experience and increase plane capacity when formed into armadas and fleets. Yes. They certainly get they currently get one shot to have melee things in their low strength to gain promotions. Yeah. So basically you use them to attack um wooden ships. Right. And the uh yeah, I never ever put aircraft carriers into an armada or fleet because of the uh, fact that it does not increase their plane capacity. You're you're just going to make yourself have to build another aircraft carrier. And since you're not typically using the aircraft carrier to like fight or defend on its own, 
uh, there's no point in giving it the increased combat strength. If, if your aircraft carrier is being attacked by enemy naval units and has to defend, like, you're navying bad. <laughs> yeah. Anti-cavalry still do not have a bonus against cavalry. Uh, well, that definitely is a major problem. How is it anti-cav if it doesn't have a bonus against it? I think it technically does, but it's not enough. Mm. Well, and it don't, like, uh, cavalry units, like, one of the first promotions you can take with them is, like, a plus five or plus seven combat strength against anti-cav units, which in a lot of cases just completely mm-hmm. eliminates any bonus that the anti-cav unit might have had. Yeah. Like, I can see that as maybe being, like, a later level promotion, but it should not be it's one so of the early. first two options that you can take. Yeah, you get that guy up to, like, their third or fourth promotion, you know, put it down there on one of those ranks, then that makes sense. But where it is, no, it's too early, and it does basically, if it's plus five, that's probably what the same bonus is against, I mean, the same bonus the anti calf units have for cavalry. I don't don't build them often enough. I cannot remember. Do are we able to make a stronger anti cavalry bonus on the anti cav units? I maybe. maybe. I think there might be a promotion that further buffs the anti cav uh, bonus against cavalry, and, and I think it's a first tier promotion. But I could be mistaken. Well, at least they offset each other in that way. Yeah, and that's yeah. been so a, it would be, a bonus. Would be a better, a better bonus would be nice, and not make the anti-anti-cav so early. Make that, yeah, second tier or something. And those promotions, I think, have been there since vanilla Civ Six launched, and people have been complaining about the anti-cav line for the entire game's lifespan. So I, it amazes me that... something is wrong. <laughs> yeah, it amazes me that those promotions weren't changed or moved at some point. You know, two expansions and a year's worth of DLC later. Uh, there's some... Uh requests for change to pantheons they want fertility rights to be buffed give it plus two food in the city center plus 20 percent growth and a free builder because they already don't give enough tiles of fire goddess can have tiles adjacent to volcanoes plus two faith plus one appeal and then geo fisher titles get or geo geothermal fissures Gain two faith and one food. Not sure how flaming water coming out of the ground gives you food, but okay. You cook over it. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that would your, work. So this is how you do your crawfish boil. You just put the pot over there in the geothermal fisher. Boom. Yeah, you just you just dump all your fish and meat into the uh, into the geothermal fisher and steam it. It's uh, yeah. it's brilliant. God of craftsmen gives or uh, should give one production and two faith. Goddess of the Hunt should give food production and appeal. Lady of the Reeds should give plus two production and an appeal. That would be really nice. The hard part for that one for me has always been that it doesn't give you the bonus on, uh... Was it Desert Floodplains? Or is it only on Desert Floodplains? Only on Desert Floodplains. That's always been the problem with that one for me, is all the places where I would want it, it's like, oh, that's right, it, it only works on desert floodplains, and all these floodplains are grassland and regular plains. Yeah, but grassland uh, floodplains are already fantastic. No, I, 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 I get that. Yeah, no, I, I definitely get that. But what I'm saying is that I always pass over Lady of the Reeds and Marshes, because the situations where I have lots of uh, floodplains and marshes, they're always not <laughs> uh, deserts. So, And I never have enough marshes to warrant using this. It's very rare anyway. You just need to play some of the maps that make a lot of marshes. Or play the Netherlands. Yeah, Netherlands and and Vietnam are good for starting next to them. Religious idols and stone circles should both be changed to plus two faith and plus two appeal. That's kind of boring, but... Here's a big one. Passive religious pressure is too weak and needs to be buffed. Hmm. I mean, have you ever seen a city change its religion based on passive pressure? Because I haven't. Only if it doesn't already have a religion there. 
Yeah, yeah, not change religion, but pick up the religion from passive pressure, but yeah. not change it. Uh, the only situations I've seen is, like, uh, if you convert all of the cities around that city, you know, with missionaries and apostles, where to where it's just completely surrounded, then eventually it will flip, but it still takes, like, 50 turns for that to happen. And when your game is usually 250 turns long, that's just too slow. Oh, well, I'm playing on standard game speed, so mine are still on the order of uh, 400, 300 or 400 turns. I play standard speed as well, but mo- um, a lot of people play online. Yeah. Work still, ethic is too good all the time. This has always kind of been a problem with the religion system in Civ Six. is that there's like a handful of religious beliefs that are just really good like jesuit education is also in there as like an enhancer belief where that's just crazy good warrior monks are useless war missionary zeal should ignore zone of control why stewardship and lay lay ministry need higher values one gold is not equal to one science and one culture i'd agree with that Natural wonders and general appeal. Preserves have made most of the rubbish national wonders great better, but some are still very bad due to lacking appeal or being unworkable. Mount Everest is huge, unworkable, and spawns in a mountain train is really bad. Somebody fix this. Well, how are we going to fix it? You got to give me some ideas here. Otherwise, we're just going to sit here and say, yeah, it's on the map so that it looks pretty. Next. (laughs) <laughs> mostly for also, a national park yeah how, think about where mount everest is in real life now how do you it's the only way it's going to show up is you replicate that in game it's not workable in real life either yeah all lake and coastal tiles need their own appeal values to improve the tile values and national wonders based on those tiles do they not already have their own appeal values apparently not I'm not quite sure what is meant by need their own appeal values, because coastal tiles uh, do tend to have higher, slightly higher appeal, uh, although maybe most of that's coming from, like, cliffs, so maybe that's what the poster's talking about. Maybe if there aren't cliffs, then it's not getting bonus appeal for being uh, on the coast. That could be. Change the code so that natural wonders do not spawn surrounded by unworkable tiles. Well, I can see how that might be annoying, but, I mean, have you seen Mount Etna? There's no workable tiles around it. Yeah, I, I don't think that sh- necessarily needs to be very high priority. I mean, it's it's just, that's kind of the way that Civ works, is some maps, you know, you get to use this stuff, other maps you don't. I mean, you just play around it. Yeah, every everything, every religious thing, every... Co- policy card, it's not all meant to work on every single map or every single game you play. Some of them are deliberately situational. Alright, so some other things that are listed here. Give each AI a uniquely catered preference setup towards faith, culture, science, gold, instead of turning everything, or turning science up to 11 for everyone and breaking the game. Okay, I think uh a little more diversity in AI activity would be good. Fix the bug where deforestation instantly jumps to 50%, causing a rapid spike in warming and sea level rise. How about just don't cut down your forests? But yes, if that is a bug that is happening, it should be fixed. Yeah, in in general, we are pro-fixing bugs. If it's not working as intended or as explained, then yeah, it should be either fix the bug or fix the explanation to make it in line with what the game actually does. Properly adjust the game for different scalable selectable speeds so that barb spawn rate numbers, spawn rate and numbers, city state troop levy costs, trading and strategic resources being locked for 40 turns, etc. So yeah, make the game more, more standard. Add flooding and dam placement to true start location maps when using golden golden sun. Gathering storm rules. Everybody knows what I was thinking about. 
consider slowing the game down, especially when beneficial secret societies are activated so the game goes beyond the Renaissance era? I don't know about that, because usually I don't win the game till after turn 400. Which, I know, not the best player, but come on. <laughs> I, don't know, I was also going to say, isn't that the point of the different game speeds, is to extend those things? Well, I think part of the issue is the that the um, technology and culture advancement uh, usually drastically outpaces uh, the um, year, the in-game year. So, yeah, I'm finishing a lot of my games in the modern or information or sometimes future era, but that's happening in, like, 1400 AD. So... <laughs> That's a that's a bit of an issue as well. Complicated. Stop the AI from draining all their gold and deleting all their units. Yeah, Figure I don't know if they're that's happening. Yeah, I don't know if it's a case of them deleting their units or just losing their units to barbarians and you know meaningless, poorly fought wars. And not replacing them. And then not replacing them. Yeah. Uh, part of the issue, too, might be that if they don't have gold, they're not upgrading their units, so they're still running around in, like, the Renaissance with, like, archers and stuff like that, and then they get killed, and then they don't replace them. Yeah. So maybe if they were actually upgrading their units and saving up enough gold to do that, you know, when they unlock the upgrades, those units would be more survivable, and they won't be just playing the entire second half of the game without units. Optimize the path to the fat, the uh, unit pathing tool so units don't take two to three turns in a one tile space because they're embarking and disembarking several times just across a single piece of land. The AI doesn't seem to be interacting with disaster competitions properly because they have no gold. Finish the world builder. Yeah, yeah. these a lot of these are good ideas. Yeah. Anybody got anything that's not on the list that needs to be fixed? Oh, I had something and then I forgot it. Well, there's obviously the the, the important one, UI. <laughs> Phil's not here to say it yet. Fix your UI. Also, oh, well, you know, because it's been an issue in the multiplayer <laughs> games recently. Fix whatever the heck is making things desync so bad that you can't get somebody back into the game. That happened last weekend. That Grim had had one desync, and we done the whole. There's a whole process of where you go through rehosting it and reloading it, and it's like, are you kidding? You have to go through all this just to try to get somebody back into the game so it doesn't sit there. Because like sometimes after you have the first desync, it keeps desyncing that person continuously unless you rehost it. Yeah, yeah. Fix your multiplayer code while you're at it. Yeah. And then there's a huge uh, thread talking about all the things they think that should be changed. There's a lot of good things. They should eliminate the settler cost going up. At least that's what somebody said. I don't know if that's a good idea or not. Well, maybe reduce the in the cost scaling, but I, I don't think you should necessarily eliminate it. A limited no, but uh, tweak it just a little bit so it doesn't scale up quite so fast. Or like for the first, like your first, I don't know, five to seven settlers has a flatter curve, and then it starts to exponentially go up or something because it's like you're, you're getting that point where you're stretching your civilization a little too much. And yeah, it'll also be dependent on map size. If you're not scaling up the cost of civilian units, then you get to the point probably by like the med medieval or renaissance era where builders and settlers just take one turn to build in any modestly productive city. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, that's not good either. If you can just spam out civilian units every turn that like defeats in large chunks of, you know, the game's design. Sounds like we've exhausted this topic. Let's find the next one. Oh, speaking of maps and things, <clears throat> over on Civinetic, she likes asking, why are my city phoning sites always so lousy? He was watching a Potato Meat Whiskey video, and his game star is absolutely awesome. He's got the river, the five mountains, five resources, three and four yield tusks. The guy, in all caps, is like, I never get a starting position that good. 
and you know, yeah, and, and Potato always does it as he, as Sherlock's pointing out, where you can see him set up the game and everything, so you know he's not messing with something. But you know, everybody else is getting these really good ones. What you know, am I just the unluckiest guy? Oh, he, I mean, Potato could also just be cutting out the you know, frequent restarting to re roll map starts. Well, but even when I've seen him live stream things, he's still getting those kind of pretty nice starts and not, I mean, he may just be really lucky with that. And he's not like putting in uh, map seeds or anything like that no, to make sure no, he... he's... Hmm. Yeah. I mean, occasionally when he's done some of the live stream stuff, he has had to restart once or twice, but more often than not, he gets a decent enough. It's not like absolutely fabulous site, but a decent site to start with and he wants to get on with him and play because he's trying to make a... He's trying to do something and make a point about something. He's not going to sit there and endlessly reroll to the absolutely perfect site comes up either. And somebody pointed out he could be tre- choosing Legendary Star, but I don't I don't think he does. I think the whole point with Potato is he's trying to do average Star or, you know, decent starts from that. But this is what Thread is pointing out. It's like, there's a restart button. But I guess you should use the restart button. Yeah, but maybe this person has uh, kept using the restart button and they're still getting crap starts. Well, I I would like to point out that load times for this game, since the DLCs have gotten considerably longer, uh, doing a restart is not nearly as bad as loading into the game the first time. Like that for me takes several minutes, whereas a restart, you know, is like one minute max. Uh, But, you know, you don't want to spend your entire night sitting through load screens and listening to Sean Bean narrate to you. As lovely as his voice is. I don't need Boromir telling me all about history. (laughs) Well, that's what he points out. Also, it's your mindset. You know, like one guy gives the example of I've got two mines of quarry and uh, three lots of wood. I'm annoyed that there's not enough food. When I've only got one mine but a bunch of grain and some sugars, I don't have enough production. Yeah, I, I do notice that one one issue with uh, both uh, Potato McWhiskey and with uh, Spiffing Brit, as entertaining as their videos are, like they, they do make a lot of these videos where they, they have these clickbaity titles of like, oh, the game is completely broken. You can get like infinite gold. But then you actually watch the video and it's like, oh, if you meet these like 15 requirements uh where most of them are not things that you're going to see in a randomly rolled game uh then you can pull off this uh this exploit and it's like well uh, then I don't really know if it's an exploit if uh if you need to spend half the game setting it up well it depends uh does it actually break the game or does it just make it easier to play the game in the sense that it makes something much more useful than it otherwise would be because I would argue that if you're using the rules and you stack stuff together until it worked, until it was really cheap, that's not uh, exploiting the game. But if you uh, stack things together and manage to get a negative cost modifier, so that it so that going over your limits makes things more, uh, so you start gaining money from maintenance costs, that would be an exploit that would be bad. Yeah, looking at you, EU four, and your ability to get above unit maintenance. Yeah, like when when he does a video where like you can just uh, use the barbarian clans or whatever to just well, I, what was it? I think he used like a naval unit, naval raider unit, and was able to pillage a barbarian encampment repeatedly for free gold or something like that. Like, yeah, that is breaking the rules of the game. So that that definitely is an exploit or a bug that needs to be fixed. Yeah. But anyway, use the restart button. That's why it's there. Or you do what the original poster actually did. It was like, uh, I'm just going to go back to playing Civ 5. <laughs> he was like, okay, you know, you like Civ 5's generation better. Sure, go for it. I don't mind Civ 5. It's still a good game. Yeah. I don't know if I like it better than Civ 6, but I, I have a lot of good memories with Civ 5. Yeah, one of the things, the hard things that I've always had with going back to a previous Civilization game is even if I think the previous game is, like, maybe, like, better in the the broad sense overall, there's always something in the newer games that, like, I feel like I, I like so much that it's hard to live without. Uh, for, so, for example, from Civ 4 to Civ 5, it was the transition to, to Hexes, 
like it's I, I always have a hard time going back to Civ Four and it's like oh everything's in squares again. Ugh. Uh, and for Civ Six going back to Civ Five, it's the the districts. Like I I do think the districts are a huge improvement to the game, and it's just hard for me to go back to playing Civ Five and just being like oh yeah the city's just one tile. Eh. Believe it or not, I'm actually ambivalent on the districts. I don't really like them or dislike them. I think they're an interesting idea, but they're not really. If I was choose, if I was going to make a, uh, a Civ style game, I would not use districts that way. But I also am not doing that. So yeah, I mean, I w- I would still do the disclaimer of you know there are still problems with map size and scaling where I still feel like cities are too close together and there's the urban sprawl and all that stuff are are problems and I would like to see those addressed so that. Uh, you know, the districts aren't spilling into adjacent cities as much the way they are. So there's still a lot of things that I dislike about the system, but it's still hard for me to go back and, and play a game that doesn't have that level of, uh, uh, you know, domestic and infrastructure planning. Anyway, what were we talking about? <laughs> I think we were finishing up talking about using the restart button. Yes. Use restart button or player with version of Civ, whichever floats your boat. Or just yeah, turn on like the legendary start yeah. option. That's that's why it's there for users who want to get those really cool epic starts. Is there something between balanced and legendary? I think abundant. Abundant okay. resources, yeah, that's that that does help. Yeah, there's a there's a drop down there that has various settings for starting uh yields. But so. abundant resources gives you more resources everywhere instead of just at the start. Oh, uh, yeah. But it's better than nothing. Yeah, I mean again, those those options are there and they're there for, you know, players who want to uh, want the maps to be specific ways. So play around with those and also, you know, try playing around with other things too. Play around with sea level. Uh play around with age of the planet and stuff like that. You know, you might find that uh you much prefer the maps that have some of those different settings. I have to assume somebody likes that stuff because otherwise why would it be in the game oh it's fun to mess around with if you're trying to do something weird but i don't do it very frequently because it, i just don't like to mess with that so much i just like to i don't like to overanalyze my uh escapism that might have been a grandiose way of saying i just don't like to think about it <laughs> i'm realizing that was very pretentious we got it, though. On a good day when I've had enough coffee, I might put it that way, too. If I'm trying to test something to see how far I can push the engine. Yeah, but most times, like, I just want to play some Civ, and I'm not trying to, like, hyperanalyze or me- be very meta about what I'm doing. Unless specifically, you know, like, I want to play the Civ, and I want to see how they work out, like, say... I think somebody later in there was an example of why they always get desert when they're trying to play Vietnam who needs rainforest. Cook the map, make it wet and more rainforesty. Then you can try out Vietnam, even if it's not as balanced as it would be in a normal air quote game. But, you know, cooking the map settings is fun. Anyway, let's talk about the next topic. This is a short one. Somebody uh, posted on Reddit. They uh, discovered the fastest way to speed run Civ. And that is to not settle on the first turn and stand in a floodplain and have a flood kill your settler. I was always going, how can this be the quickest defeat? What did he do? Did he spawn by city state? And then the flood happens on turn two. And I'm like, oh. Yeah, so this is 27 second Reddit clip. Yeah, it's posted by a uh, final dead lancer, I think is how you would say that, and it's uh, it's on Reddit. It's titled "So a speed run record for fastest defeat exists, comma right question mark." And yes, <laughs> it is loading up a Norway map or a map with Norway where he moves his starting uh, warrior and then moves the settler onto a floodplain. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's to try to get to the coast. So I think the plan was to move him one more time to get to the coast because you know you're playing as Norway, you want to be on the coast, and he didn't start on the coast. Yeah, and then Why yeah, didn't in you the start on the coast, dude. Why is your luck <laughs> skill so low? Yeah, in the uh, in the rollover between turns, between turn one and turn two, the floodplain floods, killing his starting settler and losing him the game. Uh, it is quite funny. 
And then, of course, because this is Reddit, the very first or the top rated comment is get good. Yeah, of course. <laughs> well, well, I mean, Phil would say the same thing. <laughs> Uh, I, Phil might also say, dang, yeah, random events, they've just ruined the game. Yes. What yeah. do you think of those? But when it happens on turn one, uh, it, it is, it is <laughs> like, it's not like you had a huge investment here, uh, especially if uh, apparently this person loads into the game. There's like another high rated comment. It's like the third comment uh, right now. Uh, I'm more impressed that you got to start the game before Sean Bean was even halfway done with his narration. I need to unclutter my PC. And then from there on, it's a discussion of uh, how solid state drives are just the best. I don't have Civ on a solid state drive and it takes forever to load. Yeah, same I here. That. I have my OS on the solid state, but uh, my game installs are on a different uh, different partition on a different drive. So yeah, it takes like four minutes for me to load into the game for the first time. It's My computer, the computer I play my Civ on is actually five or six years old now. I built it in 2015, back when solid state drives were still reasonably expensive. So I didn't have one. So I didn't I have like a a 32 gig Windows drive I guess, but uh my games are all on a on a 2 terabyte hard drive that are just all spin up and it takes forever to do anything. So when I build my new computer in like 3 years because that'll be how long it'll be until we actually have uh graphics cards available again. Thank you. Data or thank you, Bit Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, stupid cryptocurrencies. Yeah, I have most of my Steam library on the regular conventional hard drive on this lap on the laptop, but Civ and No Man's Sky both went onto the SSD because load times would be insane. I mean, not insane, but look, they load like that. So, how is No Man's Sky now? I've heard it's been really improved. It really is. I've had. The, I've had a lot of fun with playing it, and they've launched this expeditions thing. It's like a community thing they do every... Well, they've only done one so far. I think they're planning on doing another one, but yeah, it's not what it was when it first came out, and there were so many things in Promise, and they recently redid all the planet and animal generation, so there's like some really cool things in there now. It looks... It's getting closer to what they were promising at release. I mean, And they still haven't released any DLC, so that's really nice. Well, yes. not not paid DLC anyway. Well, that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah, it's all yeah. been free updates. Free massive updates that greatly change things each time. I, so. I have to say, I am amazed that the game survived. I thought for sure with the backlash and all the uh, you know accusations of the you know studio and the the head of the studio in particular, like lying about things, uh, that they would just not survive or they'd be harassed. To the point, uh, because of course this is you know friggin' internet discourse. They would be harassed to the point where they would just give up and shut down the studio. Uh, so you know, kudos to them for sticking it out and uh, actually surviving this long. That game's been out for what five, six years now. Still mad that they shut down Bioware Edmonton. <laughs> Mass Effect Andromeda was not that bad. They were just looking for an excuse. Anyway, I think we're out of Civ for today. Or at least out of the Civ talking. <laughs> yeah, we talk about other games all day, but... So, this has been Polycast episode 387. Only 13 to go until the big 400. Oh my. Oh boy. Uh, yeah, I am Canis Albinus, and I have been mostly here. And I have the regular co-host, Makalua. This episode is a math co-processor from the uh, 90s. And Mega Bears fan. It's okay, I hear 400 is the new 300. Oh no. <laughs> Does that mean we have to do 400 again? I remember, do we really want to go 400 more? I don't know, that would be 15 years. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that would make Polycast the longest running poly podcast in history, probably. We started early. It started before the podcast even knew had even was in the dictionary.
Civilization 3, 4, 5, Beyond Earth, and 6 Sound Clips, copyright Take 2 Interactive. Copyright the Polycast at thepolycast.net.